Hi, I'm Charles Galda. I'm the president of Vision New England and your host for the Church in Action program, where we talk with New England leaders and national leaders, global leaders in New England <laughs> about making disciples, doing justice, uh, and sharing Jesus. Uh, that opens the doors to sharing Jesus when we're disadvantaging ourselves to serve others, and it transforms our world. This week, I am very excited to have Johnny Erickson Tata as our guest. Johnny is the CEO of Johnny and Friends, a Christian ministry that provides programs and services to thousands of special needs families around the world. Uh, Johnny advised Presidents Reagan and Bush, uh, Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice, the Lausanne Committee for World Evangelism. She's been awarded several honorary degrees, including a Doctor of Humanities from New England's Gordon College. Uh, she's also served as the general editor of Beyond Suffering Bible, which is a special edition published by Tyndale for people affected by disability. Johnny, thank you so much for being with us. Oh, Charles, so grateful to be with you. And of course, all of our listeners, viewers, I'm just grateful that uh, we're gathering together to talk about an, an important topic. Amen. Amen. We, we just completed an exercise talking with leaders around New England about the needs of the post-pandemic church, what the church needs to look like uh, after the pandemic and all that's been exposed in it. Uh, and one of the biggest themes in that was doing justice. Uh, and the key point being a lot of us have a narrow view of biblical, uh, of uh, sorry, a narrow uh, biblical definition of what it means to do justice that needs to be expanded. And the one we've been using is it's is injustice is anything that violates the pre-fall order. So we're called to do justice, uh, which means we need to fix the things that violate the pre-fall order. And so with that understanding, we live in a pretty target rich environment for opportunities to do justice. And we're going to be talking about that for the next couple of months on the church in action. Um, Johnny, I think before we jump into how that relates to our conversation, I think everybody knows you and Johnny and friends, but just in case we have somebody who doesn't, could you just give a little bit of an overview of who you are and what Johnny and Friends is? Well, real briefly, Charles, I'm coming up on living 55 years in this wheelchair as a quadriplegic. At the age of 17, I dove into shallow water, uh, hit bottom. It crunched my neck back and snapped my vertebrae and, and severed my spinal cord, which has left me a, a quadriplegic without use of my hands. I've got pretty good shoulder muscles, but that's about it. So I've lived life without use of hands or legs for more than half a century. And and yet, I'm so blessed, Charles. Um, I think it's because God delights in blessing those he has broken. And I've experienced a great deal of brokenness, but the blessings of his grace, his perseverance, his courage, his endurance, I could go on and on, fills my heart with such satisfaction in him and his promises. So through our ministry at Johnny and Friends, and we're about 43 years uh, working at our mission uh, to give the gospel of Jesus to people with disabilities around the world. Um, but the, the mission of Johnny and Friends is just passing on those blessings to the world's disability community. And of course, that brings us to the table today, doesn't it? Mm, it, it does. It does. And maybe uh, some insights from you would be ha helpful. Um, for many of us who aren't directly affected by disabilities, we may just not be aware uh, of what some of the challenges are. Could you maybe give us some insights, the challenges um, that people and families affected by disabilities deal with day to day? Well, sometimes when we think of people with disabilities, we tend to think of the young men with cerebral palsy who reside in the uh, the residential facility down the street. But but disability is a lot bigger, a lot wider than that. Um, disability could be a family whose main breadwinner suffered a stroke. Uh, disability in a family could be your elderly parent who now struggles with, with uh, Alzheimer's. Disability could be a significant attention deficit disorder of your toddler, you know, of your or your kindergarten child. And, and so disability comes at us in all shapes and sizes. And Charles, our ministry during COVID did a social impact study. We, we interviewed hundreds of families struggling with disability that we have served over the years, hundreds of them. And 75%, the, the, the big need is for respite. Um, mm -hmm. People who are caregivers are worn out, weary, exhausted. Uh, the day-to-day -day demands of living with a disability, it is overwhelming. And so isolation, social isolation, financial strain, 
um, the inability to get out into the community and feel like a, a part of the mainstream of life. I mean, here I am, uh, Johnny Erickson Hanna, and I'm, I'm hard pressed to look for help to assist me with my uh, toileting routines and my overnight routines and my caregiving routines, getting up in the morning, bed bath, uh, sitting in a wheelchair, brushing my teeth. Don't be thinking that just because I've written books and I knew Billy Graham, that it's easy. It's yeah. not. And so I, I represent a, a group of people whose needs are, are never ending, it seems. And, and that is the, that's the big challenge for um, for the disability community, and, and and it sounds like right. Just practically speaking, that's a that can be exhausting too. It can be exhausting for any family member of that child or adult with a disability. Uh, mm-hmm. My husband is approaching seventy five, no seventy six. My goodness, years old, and uh, he simply can't do the things he used to do for me. Mm-hmm. I noticed just this morning when he was helping to lift me out of the bed and into my wheelchair. He's getting weaker. We talk about this. And so already we're putting the feelers out, looking for more people to help. And that's, that's constant for yeah. families with, uh, with a family member who has a significant disability. So. Yeah. Now you describe the financial strain of, of families impacted by disability, the, um, uh, the physical strain, the emotional strain, the isolation strain. During the pandemic, what's changed in that? I'm assuming it didn't get better. It got a lot worse, didn't yeah. it? Yeah. I mean, so many of, uh, okay, I have a few caregiving friends who help and COVID kept them from our front door. Mm. And so uh, there were times I had to be in bed and, and there's just nobody to help. Mm. And then I think of my friends who have children with significant disabilities, uh, social services, uh, supports from the educational system uh, just became non-existent. And so these children, let's say with autism, uh, who have a very regulated routine and who are emotionally balanced because their expectations are being met through various routines, that's blown to smithereens. Mm. And suddenly moms and dads are um, in a house where kids are going ballistics. I was just talking with a special needs mom last week at one of our family retreats, and she confessed to me, Johnny, during COVID, there were times I just shut the door and went into the garage and cried. I remember one day, she told me, calling my husband at work and saying, I don't care what you're doing, drop it and come home. I can't do this anymore. Uh, She has a child with Down syndrome and another little boy with autism. So uh, sometimes the typical community doesn't really understand the extent of the uh, weariness, the exhaustion, and often the hopelessness because it occurs behind closed doors. And uh, COVID didn't make it easier. Yeah, yeah, and and so many of our churches aren't in a posi- aren't, aren't today engaged with the disability community, and as a result, we didn't see it ourselves that there was a need. Right. Well, you know, disability ministry is not about a structured program uh, with a session approved budget. It's not about uh, having a hired staff or adequately trained volunteers. All of it's good. That, that's good stuff. But disability ministry is mainly about relationships or, or more specifically, it's about friendships. People with disabilities um, want to know that if they don't show up at church, somebody's going to miss them. They, they want to know that if they don't show up, somebody's going to call them and say, where are you? We want you here. How can I help? Yeah. We're, we're, we're not making it without you. Uh, we miss you. That's what special needs families want to hear. Hmm. Um, you know, they don't want to feel um, as though they are disrupting a normal, regular, uh, regimented Sunday morning worship service. They, they want to be a part of it. Yeah. And uh, sometimes that means making some adjustments, being creative, but uh, people want to know that they belong. Well, and uh, there's a couple of things I want to hit on in that, that that I think is really helpful for us to hear. But the one reminds me of something you said. I, I remember seeing you speak years ago at Dallas Seminary, um, probably about 10 or 15 years ago. I was down there on business and and went there because I knew you were there and watched you from between a crack in the door and the wall because there was standing room only. 
And you said something that stuck with me that I think is, is really important. It's you said the church can't be the church without those who are affected by disability. Can you sh share what you mean by that? Well, God's power, we are told in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 9, God's power is best displayed through weakness. And if we want to experience the life-transforming power of God in our congregations, then we've got to learn how to embrace people with significant weaknesses. Mm -hmm. um, 1 Corinthians 12, 22 says that, quote, those who seem to be weaker are indispensable in the body of Christ. And there's many reasons that they are indispensable. Uh, by the way, first, let me say, they only, quote, seem to be weaker, the Bible says. Mm. You know, they, 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 yeah. they've got this secret. You know, the secret <laughs> is God's power is going to show up best through my yeah. weakness. So you're, you guys are missing out something if you don't have me to church. So, I mean, it, those who seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the reason they're indispensable, obviously, they have gifts to contribute. Um, but they're indispensable because it gives the rest of the body of Christ a chance to serve. And Charles, as you well know, normal Christian service is always sacrificial. Um, to serve means it's going to cost you something. Yeah. It's going to cost a little bit of extra effort and time. But if you do, the rewards will be out of this world. Besides, Jesus himself says, um, go out. Find the disabled, the lame, and the blind, he says in Luke chapter 14. Do this and you'll be blessed. There's not many places in scripture that our Savior gets that specific about exactly who he wants invited into the kingdom. But of all the people you might overlook, you know, do not overlook people with disabilities. Um, pull up the tent pegs of your thinking beyond your rich friends, relatives, and neighbors with whom you are very comfortable and with whom you identify and you. It's easy to be around them. You know, mm -hmm. Move beyond those comfort zones and uh, go out. Be proactive. Find those people and bring them in. And, and so there's a clear theological foundation for us doing this um, and why we need to step into this space and be less comfortable, um, which is what love is about, right? I, I've, I've keyed in so much in the last year that with, if there is not sacrifice, there's not love. And Absolutely. So it's easy for us. We're comfortable saying, well, Johnny, I love you. Right. And then just walk away and I got, I don't have it. Right. And it's just, but it's just words really until I actually serve you and it make that evident the same in reverse. And, and so, um, why, so if that's true and it's such a clear biblical mandate for us, uh, why does it seem like most of us believers, most of our churches really aren't engaged in reaching out to and serving and, and loving those who are affected by disability? I think it's because we don't know Jesus Christ at heart. Hmm. I think if we knew Jesus Christ at his heart. We would want to love the people that captured his heart. And if you look in the Gospels, you flip through any page, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, there's Jesus connecting with somebody who's got a disability, mm -hmm. making their lives different. Um, demonstrating his love among them. And so Christ himself is our own best example of how important he thinks um, reaching people with disabilities really is. And God's heart even shows up in the Old Testament in Psalm 10, verse 17. God hears the cry of the afflicted. Uh, that, that, that's a powerful statement. Um, in other words, when people with disabilities have a need, God, God's cupping his ear. He's listening. And, and uh, I often like to think of the way Psalm 18 uh, pictures someone with an affliction crying out. Oh, my goodness, if you read Psalm 18, there he is, parting the heavens, throwing lightning bolts, I mean, scattering the winds, doing everything to reach down and pull that individual up out of his misery. But he needs our hands to do it. I mean, mm -hmm. God is doing everything from his end to alleviate the suffering of people. He just needs our hands to participate with him, his heart. Yeah. And, and we're missing, I'm doing a study on James, and we're missing entirely when our response to it is be warm and well-fed. Right. <laughs> yeah, faith of that works isn't is very much, is it? Right. And, and, and so, so how do we step into this? What, what, is there a, like a threshold of what a church needs to have to make its culture work, or is it something more? And 
help us help us think about that if you would. Well, um, you mentioned a moment ago that true Christian love is always sacrificial. It's always going to cost you something. It's always going to require more of you than you anticipate. So I think you have to look at um, outreach into the disability community from that perspective. It's going to cost you a little bit, but that's okay. You will have the reward of the Lord God himself as you reach out. And, and besides, as I mentioned a moment ago, um, it's not about a structured program with a good project description and trained staff and a big budget. It's, it's about relationships. It's about befriending people. You know, I heard not long ago that access is having a ramp to the table. Mainstreaming is having a seat at the table. Inclusion is having a voice at the table. But embracing somebody with a disability, that's being heard at the table. Yeah. And that, that's what we need to do. That's a matter of relationship. That, that is, I care about you. You're a special needs mom who is stretched so thin and you need some respite care. You know what? The girls in my Bible study and I, we're going to come to your house and we're going to learn a little bit about your routines so that we can learn your son's uh, needs. And we're going to sit with him. Uh, a couple of us girls are going to sit with him, play games, whatever, go for a walk, go down to the park. We're, we're, we're going to be with your child and we want you to go get your nails done. We want you to go have coffee with your girlfriends. I mean, that's disability ministry. Again, we're not talking about a big structured program. We're talking about people uh, mm -hmm. caring and loving for each other, especially those who have great needs. Yeah, because I think there's some 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 of us think about it. Well, it's a lot of money to do this kind of thing, and I have to be I have to gear up the program and the facility to handle everything, which is not where most of us are. But what I'm hearing you say is that's not even the right way to think about it. No, again, it's about relationships. I mean, you wouldn't, you'd be so surprised, and I, I'm sorry, I don't have the statistics for New England in front of me, but how many families break apart, uh, how many divorces there are, because there's such a lack of respite. Uh, dads just, um, ah, in our own uh, family retreat program, we will hold 36 uh, family retreats across the nation. We'll do a couple up there in New England, and we'll have the rest of them across the U.S. and in developing nations and it breaks my heart because always and always there are an inordinate number of special needs mothers who come as single women and boy that's uh, that's a great need and they have the heart of our savior these are the ones that jesus is is caring about and and, and longing for us to touch so um i i would suggest charles that if any of our listeners want to get plugged in or uh, want to learn how they can get started, um, connect with our Johnny and Friends New England team. Uh, you can probably do that through connecting with you friends at Vision New England, or probably right there at Vision New England. You've got resources there yourself. And, uh, yep. and let's get started. Let's, let's, let's make a difference in the lives of these people. We, we do have a, a web page with disability ministries for folks who are looking for visionnewengland.org. And if you want to get connected with uh, the Johnny and Friends group here and you can't find them, just let us know and we will plug you in directly. So thank you, Johnny, for saying that. The, you know, I, I think back, and so I'm sure there's some people listening to this and saying, well, but there's nobody with disabilities in our church. And, and so I remember, and I've told this story about myself years ago, when I'm gonna, I'm gonna attribute it to youth um, but I remember being very young and we were talking about, we were in a very old historic church built around the civil, civil war, all stone. And we're talking about doing a renovation and we're talking about putting in a, a disabled bathroom. And it was going to be like 50 or $75,000. This was 20 or 30 years ago. And I remember saying to our pastor, I'm like, Bob, we don't even have anybody in our church in a wheelchair. And he said, well, why do you think that is? And right. And I just hadn't ever stopped to think about it about the barriers. So you're saying, hey, go build relationship, but we actually have actively have barriers in our church because for somebody to come in, it was up a very narrow ramp through a very narrow corner. And then if they want to go to the bathroom outside the building, all the way around, right? It was just impractical. How do we look at our, our what we have um, with fresh eyes to identify the barriers that we have there? Well, of course, physical access is always a challenge. Um, but uh, I think the 
biggest barriers, the highest barriers, the toughest ones are not the lack of uh, handicapped parking spaces or um, guardrails in your restroom uh, that are wide enough to have a turning radius to accommodate a wheelchair user. Um, barriers aren't even steps or stairs. Barriers are, I think, people's attitudes. Um, when you kind of close down in your thinking and think, hmm, this is just a little too much effort. I'm going to overlook this. I'm going to recommend that this family go to that church down the road because you know, they, they seem to have a better, they seem to be better be able to handle this family than our church can. And you're in trouble with that attitude. I mean, because yeah. it's, uh, you know, God is displeased with that. God, again, I will go back to your comment. Love should be sacrificial. Yeah. And so it means finding creative solutions, uh, creative ways to, to assist. And I will take this opportunity to talk about our own Christian fund for the disabled. If there are some uh, congregation pastors of church leaders of small congregations and you want to outfit your facility with uh, some barrier-free design, then please connect with our Johnny and Friends New England team. We have a small financial grant program at Johnny and Friends that we operate out of our home office here in California. And we would love to consider your financial need and see if we can partner with you to uh, put in that ramp if need be to make mm -hmm. people feel more welcomed. But it's mainly attitudes, I think. Well, and it's funny you say that because I'm remembering hearing you tell a story. I don't remember if it was at a speaking event or a video, but where people will, um, because you're in a wheelchair, they'll stand and talk to the people standing and leave you out of the conversation entirely and not even acknowledge you or greet you, um, which is is a barrier that it's just so obvious. That's the easiest thing to do is just say hello and look somebody in the eyes. And we you miss know, that I, sometimes. Yeah, I, I don't think, by the way, I, when that happens to me, I rarely think that that person uh, is, is prejudiced. I think that person just doesn't know what to do or say. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I like to think the best of people. Mm -hmm. And I do believe that most people would like to help. They're just a little awkward. They don't want to embarrass themselves or uh, the wheelchair user or the mother of the child with Down syndrome. They, they don't want to uh, say or do anything that would be untoward. So um, it, it, we have to push past those comfort zones, just as Jesus said, you know, in Luke 14, push past those, uh, the tent pegs of our thinking, get creative, take risks. And always, always the safest thing to do is simply say something like, you know, I, I see that you have some limitations and I would like to learn more about that. Can you describe to me a little bit about your, your disabling condition and, and, and what you think I should know and, and how I can help? Right. I mean, that right there swings the door wide open, right? Yep. Yep. And there, there's so many families who I know some families with dis who are affected by disabilities and they're staying home Sunday morning because there's just not an option for them. Um, th there's a church down in Massachusetts that I remember I, I almost, I got choked up watching where there was a whole deaf section and the section for deaf people, they were singing and now they're, they're doing sign language sing. It was the most beautiful things I've ever seen. Um, Bingo. And, right. Bingo. You, you have just mentioned why the, those who seem to be weaker are indispensable because when, when you see, a, a, a 14 year old with cystic fibrosis, do her best to sing a hymn in the pew in front of you. Mm. Or oh, that, that teaches you something about how you should sing the praises of God. So when people in our congregation who are unfamiliar with disability see someone with Down syndrome exude the joy of the Lord, and they might sing off key and make a really, really joyful noise that might even be distracting. That's okay. Yeah, some, some of the rest of us sing off key too. <laughs> <laughs> well, right there, it, 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 that, that person is uh, a shining example of God's power and joy being displayed through weakness. And it reminds us that God can heal our own brokenness and do wonderful things through our own limitations and to not complain about our frailties but to embrace them because in them we will learn more about our suffering savior uh, who is the Lord of joy and great grace. Yeah. Yeah. Now you mentioned before uh, that there is a small grant program that you use, but what, what else does Johnny and friends do that helps churches to 
uh, think about, engage in disability ministry and just serving and loving people who are affected by it. Oh, we have an online, online course called Beyond Suffering, and I would encourage some of our uh, leaders who are listening to go on our website at johnnyandfriends.org and sign up for our uh, online courses. Lots and lots of videos on uh, basic questions on how you can make your Sunday school an environment where children with autism uh, who can tend to um, oh, maybe have a bit of a meltdown or maybe they're stemming, that is a, those un, you know, movements that uncontrolled that might be a distracting to your uh, other students, what you can do to make your classroom an accommodating and accessible and a welcoming place uh, for children with disabilities, as well as a safe place. So there's lots of videos that we have. I know that our Johnny and Friends New England team, uh, Liz Babbitt and our friends are doing an awesome job of connecting one-on-one -on -one with churches to help them develop a, an outreach a simple outreach, a basic outreach. Uh, yeah. Sometimes it might be as simple as uh, a, a Saturday morning, Mother's Morning Out, yeah. where again, a couple of church volunteers come and learn a child's routine and give that parent a break. It's a good way to begin. And uh, it's great advice. You And you mentioned that there's an opportunity for churches and believe, you know, believers, whether it's their church doing it or them independently, of plugging into the Johnny and Friends camps for the retreats that are around uh, the nation. And of course, in, in New England, they're in New Hampshire. And so can you can you speak to the person who's saying, well, I don't know how to do something like that. I've never been trained. And I, can you just help them? <laughs> well, we need volunteers at our family retreats, even up in New England, New England, always looking for more help. And don't worry, you don't have to know anything about disability. All you have to do is have a servant's heart and you'll come a day early and you'll learn about your uh, child's needs that you're going to be serving for the week or that person with a disability or your wheelchair user. You'll learn how to push a wheelchair and, and what to do or what not to do. And we'll answer your questions. We'll make you feel really comfortable. And uh, we'll put you through that quick basic training. And uh, then you'll be serving that family all week long. And people come to our family retreats thinking that they are going to bless a special needs family. But invariably, it is the volunteer, or as we call them, short-term missionaries, because we ask our volunteers to underwrite their own meals and lodging so that we can keep the, the price down on the cost for families to attend. You, you will go away so blessed, so inspired, so encouraged. And it is a good environment in which to catch the vision for a disability ministry in your own church. Mm. You'll come back from family retreat and you'll think, oh my goodness, I had such fun. That was such fun. We should be doing this in our church. Yeah. And you'll get lots of ideas at our family retreat and then export them to your own congregation. How about that? Yeah. And I, and I do hear that from people who go year after you go back year after year after year because it's such a meaningful thing to them, right? When we care and serve and love other people, God blesses us. Who knew? Right? <laughs> Absolutely. Hey, Johnny, we've just got a couple minutes left. May, could you share maybe just one cool thing that you've seen God doing in your in your ministry or your life in, in the last weeks? Well, the last weeks, okay. I will talk about then, uh, well, two things I'll talk about. Um, we are working with our in-country partners in Ukraine to rescue Ukrainians with disabilities. Uh, our ninth evacuation is scheduled for this week and we'll be bringing people with disabilities and their caregiving families from some of the hottest spots in Eastern and South Ukraine. It's not easy to get them uh, safely across the country to the town of Lutsk, which is our coordination center, and then across the border into Poland. So I'm very, very happy that at least we can be a part of, uh, of making life a little bit better for many of these Ukrainians with disabilities. So I ask our, our uh, podcast friends to please pray, be praying because all these people need to be uh, situated in accessible and welcoming homes in uh, Europe. Of course, we're very grateful to friends in Germany and the Netherlands who have just been a, done a stellar job. Also, I'll be, um, this is not a very pleasant part of what I want to say, but uh, I know that part of your podcast has to do with justice issues. And here in my own state of California, the California Assembly just passed a uh, State Bill 2223, which um, when women um, 
uh, give birth to, let's say, a child with a disability, uh, this law uh, will protect them from criminal charges uh, related to uh, the infanticide of that child up to seven days. So uh, the Bible says in Proverbs 31, speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, for the rights of all those who are destitute. And elsewhere in Psalm 82, defend the poor and the needy and the oppressed. Rescue them, the Bible said. Oh, I can't think of a more powerful biblical mandate than those two portions of scripture, not only to protect uh, infants with disabilities here in the state of California, but as uh, sadly, uh, as California goes, often goes the rest of the nation. So um, we need to be prepared to stand strong uh, against our state assemblies when, uh, when they push forth bills that do not value the dignity and the, and the life uh, rights of persons with disabilities. That's shocking. Thank you for sharing that with us. And we, we will be praying for that. And it's just exciting to hear what y'all are doing in Ukraine. Thank you. Johnny, thank you so much for being with Thank you for a lifetime of ministry. Thank you for being so generous with your time again with us at Vision New England. Um, and just thank you for being so faithful and for the work that you do. Well, thank you, Charles. And I'm so grateful that Vision New England has such a long history, such a marvelous legacy of caring for the needs of people in New England, the spiritual needs, yes, of course, and practical needs. So thank you for what you're doing to strengthen the church in that part of our country. Thanks. I appreciate that. I'd also like to thank our producer, Jessica Mangano, and our listeners. We hope this discussion helps us be the people of God, doing the work of God in our communities, so the world sees it and praises God, transforming our world. Visit us at visionnewengland.org for past episodes, other resources, and click on Donate to partner with us to accelerate evangelism in New England. Our program is brought to you by our friends at the Luis Palau Association, who are dedicated to proclaiming the good news, uniting the church, and impacting cities worldwide. 